Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Junior Doan's The Spark. I'm Junior Doan, and thank you for joining us. I was fortunate to be able to talk with American ornithologist David Allen Silby while he was in the Great Lakes Bay region for the Whiting Festival of Dow Gardens Birding Festival. David is the author of much admired guidebooks on birds and trees. I hope you will find our discussion as fascinating as I did. thrilled you're here and uh, <clears throat> there's such a presence in your field right now but in the early days what got you interested in really an unusual uh, part of life? Well it wasn't so unusual in my family. My father's an ornithologist so I grew up bird watching and um, a lot of the adults that I knew were bird watchers. We would go out every weekend and meet groups from the New Haven Bird Club in Connecticut and um, watch birds it was something, it was kind of a family, family activity. Yeah, isn't that interesting? It's like skiing or anything other. What was the conversation around <clears throat> the dinner table at night? Um, it was often, well, wide-ranging, wide of course, but often about birds. And, uh, what, and the conversation about birds is often what's what's coming up tomorrow yeah. <laughs> what's what might what's the weather what might happen tomorrow what birds might be migrating where do we want to go this weekend what should we try to see it's a very sort of forward looking i think kind of optimistic hobby in that way you're always uh, anticipating <laughs> something good what's going to show up what's the best your best chance of finding something exciting when your father was teaching you how to see a bird or even find it in a tree, do you recall what, what the steps were or what he said to do? Oh, it just sort of comes naturally. There wasn't any uh, real instruction in that, that aspect of it. Um, and kids in particular are really good at um, the eyesight and hearing is so sharp um, when you're young. So my brother and I, when we were 10 years old, we had been birding for a couple of years and learned just from experience sort of what to watch for. You're watching for movement mostly when you're looking for birds. You're, you're studying, a, studying a wall of trees or leaves or bushes or across an open field and really just watching for movement. You know, it's really interesting you say that. I've been part of the birding festival here in Midland the last couple of days, and I know nothing about birds or birding, but I like to do, I like to put myself in situations where I don't know anything and can, um, you know, guess what they're talking about and finally feel comfortable after 20 minutes or so. But on the trips we've taken out to the cemeteries and other places, what I notice is it's not only movement, but I'm starting to look, what's odd about the leaves? Does it suddenly have a, yeah. a blotch on them? Or, you know, is the arc interrupted in some kind of odd way? And can I give that another second or two before I, you know, walk away from it or yeah. don't believe in it? That's exactly right. Yeah, you're looking, looking for things that are out of place. Out of place, and even in these couple of days, I will tell you that my, um, um, my range of vision is different. Uh, I was always looking at the, like the surface of the landscape. Now I'm going into the landscape automatically. You know, who's here? And um, <clears throat> um, my friend had an example of uh, looking through her binoculars in a house, and she saw a deer in the way far distance. And all of a sudden, the deer just stares at her. Are they doing the same thing? 
Yeah, and um, I know a lot about bird vision. I don't know much about, about vision deer. in other mammals like deer, but birds have very sharp, uh, not necessarily sharper eyesight than we do, but other adaptations, like they're better at sensing motion and better at picking out things that contrast with the background. A lot of birds can see ultraviolet light, a whole range of frequencies that we can't see. And, um, and that apparently helps them to pick out, like against a, against a bunch of foliage, green leaves, they have a whole other range of colors that they can see. And, and some things like insects will really stand out against the leaves because they're reflecting ultraviolet light. So the birds are picking up on a lot of things, and the, the way their eyes work, they're better at sensing motion than we are, so. I have other friends who claim they can see auras around people. I can't, but I wonder if this is similar, because I was thinking, are there separate bird clothes you wear, like camouflage? But then if they sense the aura or the heat, then it's not worth it. So do you have special birding clothes outside of comfort? No, and, and quiet, uh, soft, like a, a fleece jacket is better than a, a nylon rain shell. The crackles. The crackle, yeah. The, the noise of some clothing is really distracting. So I go for clothes that are quiet. <laughs> yes. And I know people say wear drab camouflage sort of neutral colors, don't wear bright white or bright colors. Um, I'm not sure that really makes a difference. And then given that birds can see ultraviolet light, you have to know whether your clothing is reflecting ultraviolet. And some, some dyes will reflect that. How do they know they see ultraviolet light? Um, you know, I don't know exactly what the tests the test were, was. but, but um, they do a lot of experiments in the lab with birds that, birds that can be kept in captivity like pigeons. They can do a lot of experiments there of training a bird to go to one target or another for food and then changing the target. Oh, like training them that they might train a pigeon that the, if they peck the target that's reflecting ultraviolet light, they'll get food. Oh, and then move the ultraviolet light around and see if the pigeons go for still go for the one with the They're ultraviolet. Really smart. So I pigeons, didn't, yeah, yeah, pigeons are very smart. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of experiments testing their abilities. They can um, they understand the difference between uh, concepts like a drop of water, a stream of water, um, a lake full of water. They sort of recognize that it's all water, but different forms. Hmm. And they've managed to train pigeons to, to distinguish impressionist art from modern art, to recognize styles of art as a class. Is that true of other, other birds? Well, they probably haven't tested yeah, it. It's yeah, it's difficult to do the experiments because a bird has to be comfortable in captivity yes. for a long period and, and trainable. So they train the pigeons in the same kind of way to train them that this, like, painting by Monet has significance and they'll get some food, and then show them other paintings by other Impressionists, and they, they go for those. And didn't, weren't they used in World War II, not pigeons, but some kind of birds to take messages? And that, that started uh, thousands of years ago that, um, if you keep pigeons in a, in a pigeon loft at your house, they're free flying, but they live in the loft and you provide food for them, so they, they live there. They're domestic, basically. But, and then if you take one of those pigeons away any distance, thousands of miles, it will fly straight back to its home loft. So that's the method. They would have pigeons, like I think in World War I, they were actually used. Pigeons that were from a, a loft in, say, London, at the military headquarters in London, and they delivered them to the front in Europe, and could, any time they wanted to send a message, a secret message back to London, pull out a pigeon, attach a note to its leg, and send it off. 
and within a few hours it would be back in London. How, how do you explain that? They're, all birds are faithful to a particular location. They, even the, you know, if you have a Baltimore Oriole or a um, Phoebe, some other bird that's nesting in your yard, if it survives the winter, it will come back exactly to your yard the next year to nest again. Um, all birds have that ability to navigate and to find their way back to... And memory. Yeah. And pigeons are, they're faithful to their home loft year round, so... Do you ever have uh, birds as pets? even outdoors or indoors, maybe for your children? Yeah, I did. When I was a kid, I had several birds as pets at different times. And um, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't really that satisfying. It's not like having a pet dog or a cat. Because of the low level of interaction? Yeah, yeah. They had to stay in their cage most of the time. and, and um, uh, and I guess I didn't have enough time to really train. Uh, I had a parakeet, and, yes. and they can be trained, especially if you get them very young. But I didn't. I didn't get them until they were adults, and and didn't have the time to really spend with them to train them. Now, are you taking your children out to birding every weekend? <laughs> <laughs> My kids are grown. They're they're. Finishing, one's finishing college, one's finished. Um, and we did go birding quite a bit, or at least go out, mostly just going outdoors and, and looking, around. Uh, looking around. Yeah, and they're interested in birding, but not, I uh, didn't really catch the, the bug. Yes. Do you have, um, are you one of these people who have gifted sight in the sense if, if this line is an eighth of an inch off, you notice it? I mean, I notice when I'm out birding, the, yeah. my, my ability to, to find birds and notice things, um, it's, it's good, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put myself really above other experienced birders. And I, I think this, most of it just comes from experience. Like you were saying earlier, just learning, learning to notice something that's out of place. So. You learn, you learn your surroundings, you learn how a tree looks <laughs> and what, yes. what, what's normal and what's not normal in a tree. And, and then you have to be alert and paying attention to, so something that's not normal catches your eye. So my late husband um, <clears throat> had an uncle who was an architect. <clears throat> and when he was close to the end of the, his life, he said to me and our young daughter at the time, everyone should know how to draw. And I remember from your speech last night that everyone can be taught to draw and you do it through practice, uh, which I'm still pondering about. Do you still have that faith? When you started out, were you not a natural artist, but you could see proportions easily? Or I, when I started out, I, I don't think my drawings as a kid were extraordinary. Um, I just loved to draw, and I was really, really liked watching birds and and drawing birds and learning about them. That became my my focus after a few years. Um, and to me, it really seems like it was just a matter of practice. Easy. Of. <laughs> well, you make it sound easy. A yeah. lot of practice and a lot of study, a lot of trial and error. You have to be willing to, to. I don't want to say fail, but, but, not succeed. To yes. To Experiment. try something and have it not work, and keep trying until it does work. Um, like walking. Yeah, or playing piano, or. Yeah. Um, I heard a famous um, one of the stars of the skateboarding world. Describing his how he got into it and his practice um, sort of philosophy, and he just he said that he he just went to the skate park every day and tried things and 
even when he was failing, he felt like he was making progress, like he was getting closer to being able to do it. And I, I thought, I feel the same way about drawing, that every time I draw, I feel like I'm getting closer. To what you're aiming for. I'm making progress. Every hour that I spend drawing is worthwhile because it's moving me forward. Your books and, and now the, the app, uh, it has been quoted to me so many times in the last two days. So you've made a significant contribution to this world of understanding and, <clears throat> and recognition and even sound. Uh, we had a course yesterday, a course, a session on Tweet Tweet, you know, and how to tell the difference. And, <clears throat> and it's, you need practice there too. Yeah, yeah, sounds a whole different, whole other aspect of bird watching that takes a lot of practice a lot of experience. When you bird watch, do you when you go through automatically a list, do you do you ask yourself what is the season? What is the habitat? What can I expect? Do you have a, a, a kind of a checklist automatically t to narrow it down to what it might be? Yeah, and a lot of it's really subconscious, but yes, that's um, the expectations, the the time of year, the habitat what I've seen in that place before, what's likely, is a huge part of bird identification. Uh, I'm not going out walking around here in Midland thinking that there are 900 different species and thousands of different, different seasonal plumages possible. Do all birds molt, do all birds lose their feathers at one, <clears throat> have a different look for one reason or another? Uh, all birds molt, they change their feathers at, at least once a year, and they have to grow new feathers to, to rejuvenate their, their coat. It's their, their warmth, their weather, waterproofing, their streamlining, their flight, everything depends on feathers. So they, they grow new feathers once a year. Some birds, a lot of birds don't change their appearance right. when they do that. A lot of sparrows, for example, stay the same, but other birds like goldfinches molt twice a year and change from brownish to bright yellow and back to brownish. What do you think of the satisfactions of birding for you when you started, or for other people who do it? I only know one person who, who considers himself a birder. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's, there's the satisfaction, the sort of immediate satisfaction of finding something interesting, something different, and you know, it has levels of <laughs> find something, something that you haven't seen for a few days or a few months or something that you've never seen before is the most exciting. And then there's the satisfaction of, for me, the satisfaction of just learning um, and understanding the, the natural system that the birds they move in cycles. Everything, everything is a cycle. The, the appearance of the birds, the sounds, their migration, um, everything has an annual rhythm to it. And kind of understanding that and getting to know all of that is very satisfying. It is satisfying. Um, <clears throat> do you think birds have personalities? Yes, I do. Um, Within our species, uh, yeah, each each species has a def definitely has a personality, sort of a, a behavior that's typical of that species. And I, my study has always been trying to find the average, trying to learn what's typical for a species. So I have I haven't focused very much on learning individual birds. Um, uh, and it's difficult when you're walking around in the wild, <laughs> in, in nature, to find one individual bird and really get to know that one. Yes. Um, so I can't say much, but I, I do know that when I, when I have gotten to know individual birds, a bird that's nesting nearby that I see every day, or um, uh, something like that. I definitely see personalities. Some birds are more more aggressive, more inquisitive, more, or the opposite, more mm. more retiring than than their.
peers. <laughs> Do you have a system for producing a book? I, yeah, it's a, a lot of gathering, I, usually I try to come up with a template of what, what information I need for each, for each entry, whether it's a species or a subject, and I just gather information and kind of dump it into the template and then refine it from there. Mm -hmm. um, and it'll be from research, some, sometimes I'll just be walking around and a thought will come to me and I'll try to write it down so I'll remember it to put it into my, uh, into my reference notes later. But it's, um, I really enjoy the process of gathering the information and, and organizing all of it. Do you think people would be interested in bird stories like some of the things you mentioned last night? about the nest and, and the egg and weather changes. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, I hope so because I have a new book coming out in the spring that... <laughs> oh, do you? ...all about those kinds of things. Yeah, and I think my, my early indications are that people are very interested in that, knowing about all the little things that birds do in their daily lives. That none of us had any idea about, unless yeah. you were deep as you you are. Yeah, yeah, and the research, the research is there. A lot of this stuff is known, but it's not widely known. So um, I read that early on you went out in your van <laughs> to study birds. Uh, that kind of drive so so young. There's a side of you that is really goal driven. Yeah. Do you put yourself on a timeline when you're doing the sketches or the oh, <clears throat> the coloring in so many a day, so many an hour? Yeah, um, I try. I set deadlines, but it doesn't. I mean, deadlines sort of artificial. It, the uh, the best thing I can do is just <laughs> sit down and work. Well, and if I if I sit down and work, the work gets done. Yes. Um, and it's it's that, and I I heard another artist describing his work of a large scale project that involves finishing lots of little things that all develop into a big, a whole, a whole project. And he said it's uh, faith in the process, um, yeah. sort of like like knitting or right. the old adage about mountain climbing, just one foot in front of the other. Yeah. <laughs> And, no, and sooner or later you get there. It, it seems like a solitary endeavor. Do you ever get lonely? I don't. I, I, um, I enjoy being alone and, and I really enjoy the work. Um, it's very satisfying work. Do you need to refresh yourself by some kind of physical activity <clears throat> or some other hobby? Um, yes, I do. and I. I mean, getting outdoors, just going out for a walk or a bike ride, um, those were my, uh, my, my usual breaks from work. Is it hard for you to make a speech? It was very difficult. When my book first came out in the year 2000 and was, was very popular and my publisher sent me out on a book signing tour, <laughs> and that first book signing tour was really difficult, really. Uh, I was not prepared for it at all, and I've, I think that's common for authors that yeah. you've probably heard that from other authors that yes. writing is a very solitary and introspective Internal. pursuit, yeah. and um, and then if your book is successful, suddenly you're thrust into the limelight and and asked to give interviews yeah. <laughs> and lectures and and explain what you've done. If you were going to um, say to someone who wanted to get into this field or at least just draw, well, besides practice, are there certain steps that you have learned or could recommend to someone who's 16 to 26? I think besides practice, I would say um, sort of understand yourself or be, be very... Uh, uh, kind of analytical, introspective, um, think about what you're doing, what progress you're making, 
um, look at your own work and not not to be critical but just to be realistic about what's working what's not working um, what um, and I guess for for bird watching and it probably fits for any other um, pursuit like this um, it's all all of my work is based on my experience and my knowledge that comes from experience so the for all the time that I've spent drawing and in the studio painting and writing there's for every hour there there's 10 hours before that or 100 hours of field work so don't ignore the the experience that is the basis for everything that comes after thank you so much so we've learned a lot. It helps to have an early orientation through family or, <clears throat> or other things. It also helps. He has a wonderful personality for this because he's very self-directed. He's extremely uh, diligent about practice, which he says is the key to anyone learning to draw and <clears throat> anything else. And you heard in the last couple of remarks that in essence, he's saying practice, 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 but also evaluate if you have the ability and the desire to follow through. Good messages for, for all concerned. And I think the bottom line is to, to always know yourself, <laughs> good and bad, and your abilities to commit and follow through. How great is your energy? How great is your commitment? And you know, can you see a way through? And if not, reevaluate. So thank you. Remember, tune in next time. Do something kind for someone you know and someone you don't know. Thank you for tuning in. Ed. To contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonesthespark.com. Dot com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Doan's The Spark. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.